Um, here we go. Now, we're going to start this a few minutes early because Kevin wrapped up a little bit early. I don't think anybody will have an issue getting off a little bit early on a Friday evening for it, but I am so excited for this session and uh, glad to have this first time note camp, as we call them, our note camp counselor, but somebody who's a due diligence expert because they're out buying assets, they're out looking at deals. And she does a bang up job when it comes to looking at assets and doing due diligence. And she's going to teach a spot on your day about doing some due diligence on your assets. So uh, we have the always lovely, intelligent, and rock star Bethany Humphreys join us from sunny San Diego uh, or Southern California today. You've got your uh, microphone still muted, Bethany. Oh, there we go. Welcome to No Hi. Camp. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. And I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm losing my voice today so just bear with me <laughs> Patrick go get her some iced tea get her some iced tea and honey right now there for you all right I know it's bad I'm sorry no no <laughs> sounds good sounds good there for you as well so hey Bethany before you bring up your uh PowerPoint stuff like that you want to talk how you got into the note industry or uh I want to say forcibly arm bent into the, the note industry a little bit but what attracted you to uh you buying and investing in notes so I got started, I think it was about eight years ago now um, with my dad, as you know, and um, he was already previously in real estate. I was always really interested in real estate, being a business owner. I never went to college, honestly. I really wanted to follow in his entrepreneurial footsteps. And so um, when he was introduced to notes, it was just, I never knew anything about investments in general. And so for me, it was it was new, but it made sense to me. And I, and it was relating to real estate. And I was like, I can go with this. And so um, when he got started, I was handling like all of his due diligence for him and his own portfolio. And that's just really how I got into it initially. And I was kind of part-time. I was actually a loan officer for a while over the last eight years. Um, I helped him with other real estate related things. So I've been in real estate in general. And so when I learned about notes and how money works and all of it, it's just really interested me and I love it. You know, it's just, but I live and breathe now. It's just all I do. So, you, you know, I love it. And, and the person she's referring to is our, is our good buddy, Desi Arnaz is speaking to uh, Sunday morning on the power of performing notes and uh, Desi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Desi was a real realtor. He attended one of my classes. It's hard to believe 10 years goes by so fast, doesn't it? Eight years yeah. or whatever it was. And uh, done a great job with it, and, and second generation now, and uh, of teaching and pro potentially probably a third year before too long. Who knows? I don't rush on anything, but um, yeah. kudos. you guys do a great job at ACI Legacy Group. You guys are buying actively. You got a fund that you're working through as well, too. Correct? Yep, yep. So we have a fund that we just started recently, and so ACI Legacy Group. That's my company, and we started it about three years ago, officially LLC this year, but. Um, yeah, just over the like the last eight years, I've been able to establish like a really robust, in-depth due diligence process and checklist just from a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes, and a lot of learning from my dad too and all of his expertise over the last 30 years. And so I've really been able to build something great with our due diligence system. So I love it. I love it. Well, I will yeah. shut up. I'll let you bring your PowerPoint up and okay. share the screen. And do you want to take questions as we go through, or do you want to wait till the end for, for Q and A, Beth? And what would you prefer? Um, I would prefer probably at the end, just because I can go down rabbit trails and lose my train of thought easy. So it'd be easier if people could just write their questions down and then I'll be happy to answer at the end. All right, then we'll leave the, uh, the, the, the crazy rabbit trails to the end there for you. So <laughs> the you got your PowerPoint on your screen there? I do. It's on my second screen. Okay. So let you may uh, hit your share screen, hit your share screen there. Okay. And I and see here, I could share up. my, my PowerPoint. Right. Okay. Oh, wait, hang on, wait, let me put this. I have to put it in slideshow mode, right? <laughs> well, yeah, you, you've got to have it up open on your screen. So if you've got two screens, it may not recognize okay. the second screen. So when you your screen, it should pop up what you have open. Then you just select it from one of the six or Five All right. All right. Let's see. PowerPoint slideshow. I'm going to go with that. Oh my gosh. My voice is killing me right now. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Can you guys see it? We perfect due diligence basics. That's it right there. Okay. Love it. Okay. Great. Okay. So you guys can see it. So, all right. Well, I will get started. <laughs> so as I mentioned, I gave my little background a little bit. Um, 
what I, oh, hang on a second. I'm trying to figure out how, oh, there we go. Okay, so this is my company, as I said, ACI Legacy Group. Um, and as I mentioned, I've been doing due diligence now for eight years. I have a really in-depth, thorough, just very extensive due diligence process and checklist. And so I'm really excited to be here today just to be able to share with you guys some, just educate a little bit on just the basics. I could probably talk about due diligence for three hours, but in an effort, you know, with the amount of time I have, I wanted to keep it pretty basic with um, what I believe is going to be the top things that need to be done no matter what, what, what you're going through on an, on an asset. Some assets are really simple and clean and easy and some you know have a lot of of work with them so for today we're just going to keep it basic and just kind of the general um kind of things that you guys should be doing as you're looking into buying notes and um, things you don't want to overlook so i'm sure everyone knows what is due diligence but i'll kind of just give that anyways for those of you who may be super new um but it's basically just the examination and analyzing of data and information that's associated with um, a, a transaction with what we do. And, you know, you want to make sure that you verify everything and have all your I's dotted and all your T's crossed before you wire your money. Um, you know, we do diligence and do, we do due diligence in everything that we do before we buy a car or hire a realtor or send our kids to a new school. So it's the same concept with your investments. So there's just certain things that we want to do before we pull the trigger and get into bed with somebody. Um, so before I even really get into due diligence, for those of you who maybe have never purchased a note before, um, I think it's really important for you to, to uh, establish your criteria first. So that way you're not just making offers to make offers on things that will never fit what you really like. And so it's important for you to have an idea of what you would want to own as, as an investment. Um, you know, some people only invest in certain states or certain areas or, you know, within a certain, um, you know, term criteria. So you'll want to figure out what's, a, what's good for you. And I'd say a lot of this is kind of built just over, over time as you're making offers, as you're going through due diligence, you'll kind of determine what is a good fit for you and what's not. Um, you know, some people want, you know, the clean and pristine paper, just passive income, you know, they don't want any kind of problems or non-performing people, um, you know, this passive income type of type of situation. So if you're coming from a background of being a landlord and you like the mailbox money and you just don't like the headaches of being a tenant, then, um, you know, maybe you would prefer something that's simply that performing. You get your mailbox money. You don't have to deal with it. Other people like myself, I like to dabble in both, but maybe you like the damaged goods where, uh, you know, you have to get your hands on it a little bit more. Um, more opportunity with exit strategies and kind of workouts and you can help homeowners that way as well. Um, so again, just as you're establishing your criteria, you're going to want to determine what your exit strategy is, how you want to see your portfolio build. Um, you know, it's just a personal preference. Some, you know, something that you think looks like a diamond is going to look like dirt to someone else. Um, so it's just really what is going to be your long-term goal with your portfolio your own personal expertise in the industry or your background is then all play a part in that. Um, but as you're building your criteria, this is, I'm just gonna share with you guys a few you know, main points when it comes to building it. So determining your location is one thing. So I look all over the US kind of, I, I don't really like East Coast and a lot of the more judicial states, but whatever area that you would wanna buy, if you wanna, focus on a specific state or region, or you wanna avoid, you know, you wanna keep an eye on judicial or non-judicial states. Um, I'm not gonna get into the educating of what those are. I'm assuming if you guys don't know, just, you know, talk to your coach, your mentor, Scott, whatever, to get educated there. But just determining what area um, location-wise that you would wanna look at. Um, also lean position, of course. I only look at first position, but um, I couldn't say anything good or bad about second or any subsequent junior positions. But again, that's something you want to determine before you go make offers. What is going to be a good fit for you and your portfolio based on your expertise and all of that? So um, next will be your collateral, of course, determining when you buy a note, do you want it to be collateralized by um, residential? Or would you be looking at uh, commercial land? I see a lot of land. 
I'm not interested in land. I wouldn't know what to do with it. So for me, that's not a good fit. So if you have a background in real estate in any of these different areas, if you're a land, you know, maybe you're an investor on land, maybe you would like to own a note on land. So again, your personal preference and your history and expertise and all of that. Um, you your land stuff, you need to call me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, talk to Scott. Yeah, talk to Scott about that. I know. No, I'm talking about you, Bethany. You oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not ready to expand that yet. I would. I. I will talk to you when that time comes. Absolutely. All right. When you see something. Yeah. Um, okay. So next, I would say is your the grading or performance of your notes. So um, again, like me, I like performing and not performing. But again, it's going to depend. I mean, the uh, exit strategies are different. Performing unless something out of our control happens to a good performing buyer, you know, a car accident, who knows what can happen. You're not really going to have much happen except for just collect, collect income there. Um, and then non-performing, of course, like I said, it's more hands-on. I would say if you've never purchased a note before, you probably would want to buy a non-performing note with a partner or a coach or someone to help you because they're more, a little bit more complicated, more hands-on and a lot more moving parts. So Again, expertise comes down to that. Um, whatever your desired yield is as well is something you would just want to consider as you're kind of you know developing your criteria. You won't always be able to get the yield you want, but if you at least have an idea of you know the range that you're looking in, um, then that will also help you as you're looking at notes and you see what sellers are asking and how flexible they are. You know whether or not you would even want to pursue it. <clears throat> Seasoning is another uh, criteria factor I always look at. Um, I just had someone call me the other day asking if I was interested in green deals. And at first I didn't know what green deals were, but I understand, you know, newly originated and that's ideally what it is. So if, you know, you have to look at that too. Do you want a note that has six month seasoning or would you prefer something that can show, you know, two or three years of pay history? So um, again, that's something you'd want to consider. UPB range, um, and, and you don't need to really include all of these in your criteria, but these are what I think, this is always what I look at whenever I'm looking at notes. I always consider all of these things. And I would say the UPB range would also depend on how much money you have to invest. So for example, if you only have $30,000, sorry, I shouldn't say 30 only, but if you have $30,000 to invest, you probably wouldn't wanna look at loans that have a 500,000 UPB. Um, so just kind of having an idea of kind of the range that you would be looking at. And, and also the security instrument. So we have mortgages and our land contracts and contract for deeds. Again, if you don't know the differences between the two, I'm not gonna educate you guys on that, but it is something you want to look at. I know a lot of people that don't wanna invest in CFDs at all. Um, again, it's just a personal preference. There's pros and cons, you know, with land contracts too. So that would be something you'd want to consider before you go making offers. Is it have the right uh, security instrument that you're okay with? So now, now that you've established your criteria and what you're really looking for, now you can start to take a look at notes more closely. And before I go right into due diligence, I always do some preliminary research, kind of just like a mild, cheaper, just quick overview. And, and I guess you can call it mild due diligence before you get into it, before you make offers. And, you know, before, when I first got started, I used to do my, like my whole due diligence before I even make offers. And that not only was that a mistake because we would go to make offers and they'd be gone, but we would also just end up saying, oh, we're not interested. Even though we didn't know everything, we felt we like we knew enough to pass, but not really. Um, and so during pre-search, that's what I call it, um, you can kind of get a feel for which ones you want to move forward with. So for many of you, maybe you won't be getting large tapes or pools of notes to look at. Maybe you only get one or two, but either way, the pre-search is the same. And so what I always do when I first get either a tape of assets or even if it's just a handful, I want to first scrub it based on criteria. So I'll look at all the states that I'm not interested in, if their values are, are you know, not where I want them or if the UPBs are too high. I'll first eliminate all of those and say I'm not even interested in pursuing those. And then whatever's left over, 
is where I'll go a little bit deeper and see if, it, if there's, you know, still viable that I want to make offers on that. So I, I also like to reverse engineer the terms. And I highly recommend everyone do this, especially if you're looking at performing notes. So again, I'm not going to train you guys on this, but there's a, cal a calculator, the 10 BII calculator, where you can do this super easy. Um, but it's a really good way for you to be able to tell if a performing note is performing as it should. Um, so you just put in all the original terms of, of, the, of the note and based on how many payments have gone by, you can see if the UPB is close to where, to what the UPB is that you're being told. Um, and so that's a way that you can also determine whether it really is a good performing note or maybe there's something questionable going on. You see that the UPB should be lower than what it is, then that's just gonna allow for you to ask more questions once you get into due diligence or even at this point. During pre-search, if I see that the, if I reverse engineer everything and I see that the UPB is um, higher than what it should be, I typically like to ask sellers for the pay history, even just for the last 12 months. So I could just kind of get a feel for what's happened because if someone's trying to sell me a note saying, oh, this is a great performing note, you know, I, I want to be able to make an informed offer. And especially if I could see just from basic, you know, due diligence, such as reverse engineering, I could say, you know, something's off. So I'd like to just see what's going on. And that will also help you when you go to make an offer, you can make an informed offer and um, it'll just kind of help with the back and forth of having to reprice when you find out things in due diligence. I also do during pre-search a crime check as well. So when I look at performing notes, I don't really stress too much on the collateral. That's just my personal preference because that's not my exit strategy and that's not my number one focus. Whereas with non-performing, you're at a higher likelihood of getting the property because you just don't know what your exit strategy is gonna be. But it's always nice to know that my collateral is not, you know, right smack dab in the middle of a gang zone or you know the houses are falling down or a super undesirable area. So you can go to like you can go online to like Trulia and just do a quick quick crime check on it and just see if it's even you know an area you're okay with. Again, these are not necessary, but these are just some additional steps you could take. So you can kind of weed out the stuff that you're not going to be interested in and it'll just kind of save you time in the long run. Um, and same with the street views and pictures. So as I look at crime, if I'm able to see a recent street view, it's always nice when you see 2019 or 2020. Um, so you could look up and down the street. If you see bars on the windows or abandoned homes, boarded up homes, that can kind of mention that maybe the house is located in an area that's not um, really desirable. Maybe it's lower end or whatever. So it just kind of can give you an idea of where your collateral is. So now, where we're, we're at now is you've determined your criteria, you've scrubbed your list down of notes, so you have your select few that you wanna continue and pursue. And so at this point, when you make your offer, you wanna determine is this a clean and pristine note from what I could see, or is it damaged goods? So you can price it accordingly. Of course, we would love to buy a clean and pristine note for damaged good uh, prices, but that's just not really how the note game works always. So when you make your offer, you do want to, I, I, this is just my opinion on kind of the things you wanna factor when pricing so you can price fairly and accordingly. And that is like the performance. And so you're able to do that up front if you could see pay history when you reverse engineer it. So that's just, you know, if you're able to actually see that then you can validate your reason for pricing. Same with the remaining term of obviously if long of a term left, then um, you're mainly going to be getting back principal. Um, whatever your desired yield is and, and discount, you know, you can price it how within your range. Um, but again, you want to price it according to just the true status of the note. You don't want to be unfair and over, you don't want to under, under offer, you don't want to over offer. So by doing your pre-search, it kind of puts you in the right playing field. And um, same with seasoning. So if it's obviously a note that has five-year seasoning is gonna be worth more than a note that has three-month seasoning. So 
with all of those considered, it's going to allow you to make a fair offer. And by doing your pre-search, you're, you're being fair, you're, you're, you know, you're being thorough, even up to this point. Um, and this is just, this is what I do with every single note. And so every time I have a reprice or when I price things the way I think is fair, I always have a reason. I don't just like to lowball or I'm not willing to just overpay. I want to be fair to everyone involved. So we'll get right into our due diligence now. So now that we have, let's just say, for example, we're good. We, we're going to start due diligence on our good note. Okay. So when my offers get accepted, um, I go right into the deep dive when I send out my email with what we need to do for due diligence. This is kind of the categories that, um, that, we're, that we're working on. So we get our digital collateral file. Um, so you won't get your originals. So if you've never uh, purchased a note before, they're not gonna send you originals at this point. It'll just be an e-file. Um, you'll do your collateral review. So of the property or you know whatever your collateral is. And I, I do a review on the seller as well. So I'll get into that here as well. I'm gonna break down all of these categories. So with the digital file review, these are just the main documents that I believe are necessary to conduct your due diligence. As I mentioned, there's a lot of what if situations. I'm not gonna get into that. I'm just gonna give general. This is what should be kind of across the board, at least with performing. Obviously, if it's not performing, you don't really need to see pay history, but with performing, this is what you wanna see. Um, and so I'm gonna break down each document and what I look for and why I look for it. So it makes sense, okay? So the promissory note, security instrument, and the deed. So when I look at the promissory note, I always first want to look at the current note terms because you want to make sure that it matches what you're offering on. Um, if you see that there's something off, it may be the, the monthly payment doesn't match, the monthly payment that you made your offer based on does not match the note, then obviously that leads to more questions. Was there a modification, some other sort of agreement? There's obviously something missing. So you always wanna just verify that those terms match what you made your offer on. You also at this point wanna determine if it's a CFD or mortgage, if you didn't already scrub that out during your pre-search. For myself, I'll buy either. So I don't care at that point. I figure it out once I'm in due diligence. And you want to determine that because there's gonna be different um, different documents associated with each, whether it's a contract for deed or mortgage. So just keep that in mind and I'll discuss that here shortly. I always like to see um, just what the agreement is in the, in the contract when it comes to late fees um, and just what the terms are for the insurance for the borrower. So if you have, if you see it in the contract that the borrower is supposed to keep insurance, but the lender has forced place insurance, then that's just something to consider, you know, once you buy it, you know, you can reach out to the borrower and, and have them get insurance as the contract calls. So I like to just check for that. This is a big one too, is just simply making sure you have the right file. Um, we had, uh, we purchased some notes that during our due diligence, we were looking at one of the notes, all of the documents were correct to the right file but the, um, the note just didn't make sense. And we saw the address was just wrong. It was the wrong, the wrong note. So, I mean, that's something very simple, um, but it could be easily overlooked. Uh, a lot of sellers have a big portfolio. You're not always gonna be dealing with an individual private seller. So it's just important to make sure that your documentation's right, even as simply as just making sure it's associated with the right property. And I wanted to throw this one on there too, just because I'm, I'm actually in the middle of, of buying some non-owner occupied properties right now. And this is something that I always look for as well, which is an assignment of rents. Um, and that basically just states if the borrower stops paying you, you have the right to go around and collect rent from the tenants. So if you're looking at non-owner non occupied stuff, that's something you wanna just make sure is in there just so that way it's just another layer of protection for you as well. So that's the main stuff. That's the main stuff I look for when I'm looking at the, the note and the uh, security instrument. So also now you wanna look for the trailing transfer documents. So that's gonna be your assignments, your launches and any um, transfer deeds as well. Um, right now I'm just gonna share with you guys with mortgages 
because there's a difference between mortgages and CFDs and land contracts. So with a mortgage, there will be an assignment of mortgage, transferring the mortgage, and a launch, transferring the note, and there'll be a promissory note. So those are going to be the documents that'll be associated with um, the mortgages. And there, there's a deed, of course, but the deed's going to be in the name of the borrower, not going to be the lender. So there won't be any transfer deeds. And then with contract for deeds and land contracts, you'll have assignment of mortgages still. There typically is, is not going to be a promissory note because the terms of the note are in the contract for deeds or land contracts typically. I've run across cases where they have a promissory note with it, but um, it's a little redundant. You don't need it. Um, and so in most cases, you won't have a promissory note. And so there won't be any allonges needed traditionally. Um, and it's just going to be your assignments and the transfer deeds because the deed is in the name of um, the person transferring because it stays in the lender's name and the borrower has equitable interest in the property. And so those will be the, the two types of documents you look for depending on what your security instrument is. So the next thing I, we look at is the pay history. And there's a, there's a couple things in here I want to share with you guys that I believe are really, really important. And I have two little quick stories. So of course you want to see the pay date and the day that it was the day that it's due and the day that they paid. You just want to verify if you're looking at performing note. That's obvious. It's simple. Just make sure that they're paying on time. Um, obviously, the amount they paid and interest and principal if it was how it was applied. The balance due on the um, on the note if there's an escrow late charges. So you get all of that information. This is from a servicer. So servicers pay histories are obviously really thorough and they give you all the info. If you're dealing with a self-service person, it's typically not this clean, but again, another day for another topic for another day. But the main things that I really look for, because we've almost run into issues with this, number one is the amount that's being paid. So we just actually recently had a, a situation, we're closing on a, on a note, where the note was originated in November of last year and the borrower was paying an amount about $60 short. And I was like, so this borrower, this is a new note and they're already not paying their full mortgage payment. What's going on? And the seller told me that there's two entities that own the note, they're in a JV and that the borrower makes two separate payments. So that answered my question. I had to get a separate pay history. Um, but you wanna just keep an eye on that to make sure that the borrower is actually paying what they're supposed to be according to the note. And if they're not, you want to make sure that late fees and things are being assessed as it should be, or things are being applied as it should be. Maybe, you know, you just got to, you kind of need to study the pay history and understand how payments are being applied. They're not always very clean, but making sure the amount being paid is really important. And the other one that's really, really important is verifying the balance on the pay history. Again, another example. Uh, case story. So we purchased a note, I think it was about a year ago now, and we went in with balance being, um, I think it was 93,000 is what we had, is what we were told. We priced it accordingly. Everything was fine. It was a performing note. And when we got to the pay history, we saw that there was a $50,000 amount that was deferred. Um, and so obviously the UPB wasn't what what they had told us initially. And so I went back to the seller and I asked what had happened and he forgot that they had a verbal agreement. There was nothing formal, um, but they had put that 50,000 on the back burner. And so we had to renegotiate price um, and he did it gladly. And so um, that's just really, that was when I added that to our list of, okay, this is really important. You don't want to overlook it. You want to make sure that there were no verbal agreements between people and just an email saying, sure, we'll you know, forgive or defer some sort of amount of money. So that's really important for you to keep an eye on. So that's my two takeaways from this in particular, making sure that the amount being paid and just the terms on the pay history match what's on the note and what you offered on and making sure that the balance that's indicated is right and that you don't see any large chunks of funds that have been forgiven or deferred or whatever. You wanna make sure that's accurate. So that'll save your butt. Um, okay, original loan documents. So I, I really like to see original loan documents in a file, and I think it's really important 
um, especially if they've been originated after January of 2014. I'm not going to give legal advice or I'm not going to really share much about this, this law um, because I've talked to plenty of attorneys about it that not a single one can really give me a solid answer on how it works. I've really got my education from my own studying and talking with other note investors and individuals who have done their own studying. And um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Dodd-Frank law, but it's a really big deal. There's exemptions, so I'm not going to get into all that. There are exemptions. There's, you know, there's ways that people can get around this law. But for the most part, you want to see that lenders who've originated notes have at least gone through good faith in putting their borrowers through the ability to repay, at least getting loan applications and income statements, maybe credit reports, just to, to show that they went through, as I said, good faith. That's really what it is that they are able to afford to pay. Um, I actually, another story, I was in the process of buying 12 notes in Michigan that I've since canceled on. They were all originated by an individual guy who's just really old now. He just wants to sell. He doesn't want to have them anymore. And he just kind of did these notes out of the kindness of his heart and you know, they, they were not compliant in any way, no loan applications, no pay history. It was, these were a mess, but I was willing to look probably, probably look too long, but um, they were a mess. And so as we were going through, we, you know, there was no applications. There was nothing for us to see if these borrowers could even afford it. And so we found out that one of the borrowers and one of the properties was actually doing a trade of service to pay his mortgage. He wasn't even paying it out of pocket, which was a huge red flag. And so when we found out how much he made, there's no way he could have made that mortgage payment if he wasn't doing a trade of service. And I just, I, I get he was being kind and he wanted to be helpful to these people and his friends, but if he ever had to stop doing this trade of service, I mean, then this guy either would have had, had to been on the street or he'd just have to give him the house because he couldn't afford it. Um, and so, it's still important, even if you have a great heart, you still need to um, respect them as consumers, borrowers as consumers, that they still need to be able to pay and afford their house. And so you want to make sure that they're not getting gouged by, you know, insane interest rates and that at least having an application and credit report, um, pay stubs, just so you can kind of get a feel that, okay, these people could probably afford it if you ever got audited. <laughs> You know, I don't know the process of it. I've never been audited by the CFPB, but it's just you want to have some protections in place too. And, you know, buying notes that are obviously and blatantly done out of compliance, I typically stay away. Um, but in addition to the, to the whole laws and everything, it's also just a good way for you to kind of see how reliable the borrower is. If you could see credit report, if you could see pay stubs, then you kind of get a feel for who your borrower is. But I just want to say... Dodd-Frank is a big deal, and I feel that it gets brushed off really easily here in the note space, but I have heard that the fines can be as high as $25,000 per violation, so it's a big deal. Do your studying on it, talk to counsel, do whatever you have to, just to make sure you're protected there, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Don't but I'm going to add a little bit to it. You see a lot of Dodd-Frank issues on the owner finance stuff, like the Bethany said he had somebody there originating loans who didn't jump through the hoops that they're supposed to. When you're dealing, and I don't buy a lot of owner finance notes because of that issue. And I buy mostly institutional debt direct from banks and hedge funds, and they're usually going through all that stuff. And Dodd Frank is the loan documents of a specific thing. You got to make sure that the borrower can afford it three years from now. Make sure that everything is uniform in a lot of cases versus like drawn up on a napkin. You know what I mean? So, right. uh, yeah, if you're if you see it's not institutionally originated, yeah, you definitely got to double check to make sure it's Dodd Frank compliant. So great stuff. Glad you covered that, Bethany. Yeah, no, and thank you for thank you for sharing that too. And again, this is just what level of risk are you willing to take? So we're going back to the, the pristine diamond or the damaged goods. I mean, I'm okay with damaged goods if people are doing it right. I'm not trying to buy damaged goods that are damaged and also, you know, illegal and, and where I might have to give a property back to somebody. I'm not trying to put lose my business. I'm not trying to lose money and I, I just don't want to put myself in that. So you just want to make sure that you're covered, just get educated um, and, you know, you'll be fine if, if you just know what you're doing and um, just be aware, ignore it, don't ignore it. So that's all I wanted to share there.
Okay, so another thing that I always ask for with um, sellers as well is um, servicing information. I like to know who it's being serviced by, um, contact information, everything. I just like to have it. But what I mainly look for with servicers, I want to see their notes and communications with the borrowers and just amongst themselves. So back when on pay history, when I was talking about that, and I was, I was telling you guys how um, we found out that there was $50,000 deferred. I also read that after I saw the pay history, I read that in the servicing notes when I went through it and I said, oh, so it's right here. This conversation was had, there was nothing you know, formally done. So it's nice to have servicing notes so you can go through and see what the conversations have been. You, you will see stuff like borrower called in, they're gonna miss this payment, but they'll pay next month. So you get a feel for, again, who your borrower is and what you're gonna be getting into. Um, I also like to see the, the servicer dashboard. So just, you know, wherever a lot of servicers will have just their dashboard where it has all the terms of the note. So you can go on there and again, compare that information to the information you have and just making sure that everything connects. So whatever you made your offer on matches the note, matches what the servicer has. So that way, again, if you see if there's any discrepancies, you need to piece it together because that's really what you're doing when you do due diligence you're trying to find a reason not to buy it. And so if you see all these you know, discrepancies, fix it, try to figure out what's going on to, to get it you know, where you wanna see it. So that way you feel confident when buying it. And so that's kind of what you're doing with due diligence and especially confirming with the service or the right terms is really important. Um, and if it's self-serviced, I was gonna just mention, that's again, a different topic for a different day. <laughs> that's a whole to totally different kind of dynamic. I know a lot of people, um, yeah, I, I'll, well, that's a conversation for a different day. We have a whole system for what we do with self-service people and um, private sellers and stuff like that. So I'd be happy to talk about that another day. I'm going to throw, <laughs> I'll throw something in there. If it's self-service, <laughs> it's a whole lot less valuable of a note. Absolutely. You know, because a servicing company can cost about a performing notes 20 to $25 a month. It's so well worth having. And then there's a lot of states out there that you have to have a debt collector's license to be servicing even a one-off note. Right. And, a, and a servicing company is often gonna be licensed in that state that it's collecting on. So that's the big thing you gotta make sure of that everything's been collected properly to that. If it's being self-service, there are a few states that would allow that, but I think it, it, it reduces the value of the note because if everything's on, you don't have a third party in a, in a party where you can actually pull a servicing portal you got to take somebody's canceled checks and looking at the bank accounts. That's a whole different story when it comes to things and notices uh -huh. and notifications and statements. It's, it's worth the $25 a month. Oh, absolutely. I don't know why people don't. <laughs> and like, typically that's why I like to know up front. Like when I start my due diligence um, and even in pre-search, sometimes if I see, if I know it's not self-service or if it's not professionally serviced, I mean, that is a reason, like you said, it, it does reduce the value of the note. So um, you know, you can factor that in with, with, pricing too, because that is, a, that is a big deal. And so that's why if we find out later, it's not self-service, we have just kind of our own thing that we do to see if we even want to pursue it. Um, and part of it also is getting the detailed pay history. So that's one thing I like with servicers that you're able to get that good detailed pay history. It's not a mess. You're not looking at bank statements and stuff like that. So um, there's that. So, okay. So now that we've gone through the e-file, that's pretty much just the documents that the seller will provide you. You still need to do your own due diligence on the collateral itself. And so the first thing that we order is our BPO or broker price, broker price opinion. And that is just where you get a property valuation from a realtor. It's not an appraisal, but it's um, kind of like, a, I guess, a CMA. I don't really know what you call it, but it's just, it's just a, a, a price valuation from a, from a realtor. So um, what I look for is not just the value. Don't just take that as, as gospel. Um, I always want to look at the comps first and just see how close are they, like just getting an idea, just using common sense of, okay, this comp is, you know, 20 miles away. Like why? Is this super rural or just there nothing out there? So you want to just look at the comps, see if they seem, you know, within a few blocks, if they seem similar. A lot of realtors I've just seen, I've had to get duplicates and triplicates because they just throw these things together sometimes. So you might need to double check their work. If you're a realtor and like you have access to the MLS or what, whatever, NAR, the different websites, you can maybe pull your own comps. Or if you know how to, you could do them yourself, of course. 
Um, but I always like to get a second opinion. We always do like a desk review of our own pricing, but I like to get a second opinion just to see if we're close. Um, determining the location of the realtor as well. So if you if you have a realtor that's 30 miles away, you know, I'm, not, I'm in San Diego, I'm not gonna call a realtor three hours up in LA County to do a, a BPO for me out here. So you wanna find someone that's local in the town, especially if you're looking in rural areas, you might just need to look yourself and just, just take the time to see what office is closest to see who might be familiar with the area who can give you a more accurate um, valuation and opinion of value. Um, always reading the comments because again, if the comps are far, a lot of the time they'll just at least tell you, you know, that they, you know, it's really rural, there's just no comps available. Um, so it's important to read the comments and of course look at pictures. It's sometimes I've had BPOs where it looks like they just took the pictures off the internet. I've had realtors go back out and get me some fresh ones. So um, all of that is just what I look at. I don't just look at the value. And another story, we, <laughs> this is why you don't want to just look at the value. So we were going to buy a note, which we ended up canceling on because we couldn't come to a new price agreement. But when we offered, we were told the value was, um, what was it? I think it was 160. And um, we got our BPO and it came in at 180. And we were like, wow, this is, this is great. Like, let's go, we're good to go. We're not like, let's just get ready to close because that was our last piece. And um, we decided to take a look at the seller's BPO one last time. Um, and we noticed that the seller's BPO said the value was 80,000 the year before. And we were like, that's kind of weird. The value just doubled in you know, a year. That just doesn't seem right. Um, and so we decided to call the realtor um, on the BPO for our BPO. Um, first of all, they were over 20 miles away. Um, they said, actually, you know what? The property's probably closer to like 130. And so I don't know why they, they told us 180. I don't know. I don't know why they would have done that. Um, they didn't give us a reason. It was just, okay, then we're not, we need a new BPO, but not from you. So I actually found three local realtors that were right there. And we found one that was closest. We called, they said, oh yeah, we know that area for sure. That, that property would probably be valued closer to 90,000, maybe a hundred. So we didn't even get a new BPO. We said, okay, that makes more sense. It falls in line with the BPO from last year. I don't know how it would have gone up to 180. Um, and so we, of course we tried to reprice it. We couldn't come to an agreement or anything, but how do we just taken that as, you know, okay, great, it's 180, then we wouldn't have realized that, no, that's actually not right. We could have really, um, you know, kind of screwed ourselves there, lost some money, um, you know, so you, it's important that you call the realtor. I just say, just call, even if the value comes in higher than you think. I just ask, like, how close are you to the property? How confident are you in this valuation? Is this a desirable area? Our house is on the market for a long time. If I had to foreclose, could you sell this for me? Like, would you be willing to? Like, is this, is this a decent looking house? Is there pride of ownership? Just take the time to interview them when they give you your BPO. So that way, you know, that you have a solid, um, you know, valuation and you can move forward confidently. And if you need to reprice, then you have like a surefire, you know, evidence of, hey, I talked to the realtor, I got the BPO, this is where we're at. So if you don't take my reprice, someone else is going to deal with the same thing and it's going to, you're going to deal with all over again. So it's just, I like to double check and triple check things. So this is important just to call. All right, on to the next one is the title report. So um, we order our title reports right now. I ordered through a third party service. Um, you, you can get them through Pro Title and I don't know where else, but you can order title reports on the property. Um, and just see um, the ownership of the property, past ownership, if there's any open mortgages, things like that. And so I always like to look at the current owner on title to make sure they're the, that they are the correct owner on title. So if you're looking at, again, like a CFD or a land contract, it'll likely be the borrower's name. Um, or no, I'm sorry, it'll likely be the lender's name on, on as the current owner because the lender holds... The, the deed to the house still. Um, and so they'll be listed typically as the owner on title. And so I always like to see that it matches who I'm buying from because I have been in situations where we'll pull, we'll pull our title report and it will still show a previous lender's name. And it typically ends up being that the person I'm buying from just has an assignment that hasn't been recorded yet, but you still wanna verify that and make sure that they have 
the interest to sell it to you. So you'll want to just see that assignment if it hasn't been recorded. Um, and if it, like I said, if it's a mortgage, then it will be the likely the borrower's name on the title report as the current owner. So you just want to verify that it's correct. Um, this is also when I tend to establish our chain of title um, and our chain of assignments and allonges and things like that. As I'll go through the um, the e-file and just make sure there's no unrecorded stuff and just putting the chain together, um, just point A to point B to point C to you know like that. Just just making sure you have your chain and there's no breaks in the chain of title so you can see um, everything that was uh, recorded. I also looked to see if there's any additional mortgages. Um, I had a situation once where that showed there was another open mortgage, but we just needed to get the release. So something simple like that, you just need to double check that, make sure that you're not in you know, second position. Um, so that's important to look for. And you can also see the tax status as well. So if there's delinquent taxes, you can see that on the title report as well. Um, so again, these are just some of the main things that I look out for that you'll want to look out for as you order your title reports as well. Okay, so the last I thing that I do. This photo. I love this. <laughs> this is hilarious. I was hoping that people knew who it was. My dad didn't know who it was. He's like, oh, that's an actor? Oh, okay. I'm like, you've never seen Matilda. <laughs> But yeah, I like to um, also do my review on the sellers as well. Um, so let's see here. Okay, so especially when I'm working with new people um, or private sellers, especially, but when I'm working with new people, I take it more seriously. If I've done business with people, obviously, you know, I we built that trust and that relationship. Um, but I mean, this is important. You know, you never know who you're buying from in the, in the note space, you know, you, you want to make sure that you do your, your due diligence on them as well. And so what I like to do, and I've done in the past is get, um, like references from sellers and, and not like their mom and dad, but, you know, people they've done business with or attorneys that they've worked with just to find out, you know, how long have you known this person? Have you done business together? Do you have a good relationship with them? And just, kind of build that level of comfort there that, you know, you're, you're dealing with someone who's honest and credible and, you know, you could probably trust, you know, who you're working with. Um, also checking if they're an entity, you can check their good standing as well and just make sure that they're in good standing with their state. Um, and so that's super simple to get as well. Um, I always like to know, again, if it's an entity, I'm going to start with entity. You want to know if they are the authorized signer on behalf of the entity. And I always like to see documentation showing that they have the authorization to sign. So you want to just make sure that the person who's signing on behalf of the entity has the right to sign on behalf of the entity. You don't want to buy a note from someone who signed it who was not authorized to because then you technically didn't buy it, but you gave them your money. So it's really important that you verify who you are, um, that they have the authorization to sign. Um, and then I also want to verify that they are the holder in due course currently. So verifying that who they are is who currently holds um, title or on the, the most recent assignment, you want to make sure that it's the same entity, the same person, and um, with other parties as well. So I had mentioned earlier that um, I was working with the seller right now who it was a JV. So you want to know if it is a JV, if both entities are selling their interest in the note, first of all, um, but also um, just verifying everything that you do for the other seller. I mean, I do the same thing with both sellers, just verifying they're both in good standing. Um, of course, verifying they both want to sell their interest and um, that they both have authorization to sign on behalf of their own entities. So that's really um, important. And I was going to mention too, if you're working with a private seller, I forgot to mention this, um, to verify if they're authorized to sign. Um, I typically like to get an estoppel or something drafted that they have to go get notarized. So that way they have to show their driver's license to someone. Um, you know, I had thought about before just having someone, you know, take a picture of their driver's license and send it to you, but you can't verify it if you can't see them. So having it notarized is, is one way that you, you know, verify their identity. Um, oh, I guess I was going there anyway. So that's a way you can verify their identity. And then the other um, aspect of this as well is using a closing company 
which I highly recommend anyways. If I am ever using a private company, I always insist that we use a closing company to pr protect both of our interests. You don't know them, they don't know you. Um, if I don't use a closing company, I would expect originals to be sent to me first before I wire, which people won't do. So we always end up agreeing on a closing company. And so that's gonna be really good. So if you use like an attorney, then your money will be sent to the attorney. The collateral documents will be sent to the attorney. The attorney will verify that all the originals are there. And then once, you know, everything is good on both ends of it, then they'll disperse the funds to the, um, to the seller. They'll disperse the collateral documents to you. So that's a really good way to protect yourself as well is using a closing company. Um, even if you're using an entity, I do all the time. We, we tend to just do it just because it's safer and easier and there's not a lot of questions or anything like that. So it's important to use the closing company as well. So, so just to kind of recap um, with the basic due diligence, general rule of thumb, what we kind of went over today is truly just the basic things that you should be doing on every file, regardless of how complicated it is. Determining your criteria first, conducting your pre-search, making an informed offer, and then reading the documents, going through the e-file collateral docs, you're buying the note, read the note, um, analyzing the collateral, um, don't overanalyze it unless that's your exit strategy. I wouldn't stress it too much, but you know, be happy with it, feel confident with the value and the condition and um, checking out the seller. Make sure who you're working with is someone that is credible, someone you wanna do business with that's trustworthy. And I guess I should have added on here, close with a closing company. So it's kind of the gist. And, um, and I just wanted to mention too, to trust your gut. Um, I have been in so many situations where I felt like, oh my gosh, I've invested so much time in this. We're at the very end. We just found this one issue. Now I either have to cancel or reprice or something. I don't, I don't even know. Maybe we should just buy it. I would never do that, but it's gone through my head. Um, and I just want to say, just, just don't do it just because you feel bad or because you feel like, oh, I've, you know, invested all this time and money. It's part of the business and you're going to, you're going to spend money and you're going to cancel on deals. Um, and that's the best thing to do. You don't want to get yourself in a situation or an investment that's no good and something that's you're going to regret. So, you know, pass, if you need to trust your gut and, um, understand that if you do this, what we just went over with due diligence, you're going to, you're going to check all of your, your, you're going to dot all of your I's and cross all of your T's. So you're not going to miss anything. And, um, if you're not comfortable with it, just don't do it. There's plenty of notes out there. So that is all that I have for, for today. And I'm happy to answer any questions on, on any of that. Great stuff. Uh, David asked a question, what does she mean? Don't overanalyze the deal unless it's your exit strategy. So what I was referring to with that is um, for myself, with when I'm buying performing notes, if like just a good performing note, my exit strategy is not automatically like, I mean, you can't get the property. If they're paying it, then you're just gonna collect monthly payments. If I'm going in to buy a non-performing note, I like to analyze the collateral more because my exit strategy is likely going to, it could end in foreclosure where I'm gonna end up with that property. So there's a higher likelihood of ending up with the collateral with a non-performing note than there is with a performing note. Right. So when I look at performing stuff, I don't over-criticize the property is what I'm saying. I wanna be happy with it, but that's not my biggest concern with the performing note compared to non-performing. So that's what I was referring to. Yeah, got a couple of questions off of YouTube here. Eugene asked a question, do you like to make your offer based off of the UPB or the fair market value? Um, it depends. I always go off of whichever one is lower. So if the value is lower than the UPB, I base it on the UPB. Or yeah, if the value is lower than the UPB, I base it on the value. Right, exactly. If the fair market value is higher, you're probably going to be paying a little bit more because the, the you pay a little bit more of the UPB because the fair market value is a lot higher, right? Right, yes, yes, yes. But if the, if the value is lower, it's definitely going to be based on the value. Yeah. And when you're buying direct from a bank, ladies and gentlemen, you have to often put it in terms of UPB for a banker versus a private seller too. So like, well, we'll pay 95% of UPB or 90 or 80% of UPB, even though it's at 70% of value. You just got to know those two numbers back and forth and make sure... Like if a seller comes and tells you, oh, I want 60 cents of UPB, you've got to make sure the value still makes sense of what you pay off that, right, Bethany? So you're not pay overpaying like right. 90 cents on the dollar for an asset. It doesn't make any sense on non-performing side. Right, right, exactly. 
Um, let's see here. Kind of quick ask. He goes, uh, it's Humphreys is Bethany's last name. If you were asking that, it's right there in the slide for you. Um, what's the, what's your best source for leads for finding no deals? Hmm. I just make phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> But other, I love, other, other note sellers and network, I mean, it really is a small network, right? It, it, yeah, it really is. It's networking. Before everything shut down, you know, going to events was a big way of connecting with people. I miss in-person events. I'm not a big online event person. I really wish we had more in-person again. It's just, I feel like in our, in our, in our business too, it's nice to connect with people that way. But events, um, connecting with people online and just... Just kind of, I just do research and digging and phone calls and that's about it. Mm -hmm. I agree there. Uh, yeah. would, you, would you want to see the original note? Yes, always. But you're not going to get, you're not going to get the original note though. This thing is always going to be a PDF copy, soft copy versus right. copy. Now, Bethany, can you touch a little bit about what something happens and they don't send you the original loan docs? What happens then? So uh, you're saying like after you wire and you close and you don't have it? Yeah, they, they can't find the original file. Well, for me, I've put protections in place for us and our agreement. And, and that, again, you, you could save this from happening by hiring a closing company. Right. So that protects you there. But if you don't, um, another protection you can do is have wording in your, in your LSA, which it traditionally is. Um, and like I know our LSA, we have that added in there is that they are, you know, like certifying that there are all originals and that they have right. all originals. That's something I also ask from the beginning. Can you please send me an email confirming you have originals? But if they don't, you know, I've never really run into that situation. The only situation I've really run into is where they take forever to get me stuff. Right. They take forever, like four months to get me the originals. But I mean, I think that, I think that there might be something in an LSA that they have to buy the note back. I mean, you probably have to fight, you know, and go to court if they won't send it to you, but if they don't have the original note and you bought it, um, you could get, I think as long as you have a copy of the note and you might have to get a, a, a lost note affidavit. Yep. Don't, don't quote me on that. You probably want to speak to legal counsel per state, but from my experience, when I purchased a note with not, with no original note, we had to get a lost note affidavit and we had to have a copy of the note and then that was sufficient. So yeah. Well, that's the thing. There's most, yeah, you're going to have reps and warranties in most loan sale agreements. And usually there's a 30 to 45 day period for stuff to turn in. If they don't have it, they either, either pay you off or substitute collateral, substitute a different asset. Um, what, you know, it's, people ask me, oh, but what about MERS? And MERS hasn't been an issue for years, everybody. It's yeah. a big thing there for you. But that's the thing. You, you can re you can recreate a collateral file most of the time, but if you can't, if it, this is why you always review collateral file before funding. I've seen some shady sellers out there try to get you to fund before providing soft collateral file. That's usually a big red flag that screams. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, I would never no. If I in the beginning, if they don't give me what I need, then I'm not working on the file, and I just say I'm not doing anything on this FYI. So if you're thinking I'm going to buy it from you, I'm not because I don't have anything to do. So um, it, it just, again, like a protection for you is just use a closing company. It's worth the couple hundred bucks just to close it safely and have the attorney call you and say, yes, I'm looking at the original note right now. You're fine. So, you know, you can close. So it's yeah. just safer to do that. Yeah, exactly. It's called kind of a, it's, it's also referred to as a Bailey letter in there where you, you, the uh, seller agrees to ship it to an attorney and that basically attorney, you wire the money to the attorney. It's an escrow basically. They don't release the funds till the original docs show up there for you. So, right, right. Mary asked a question here because Bethany mentioned a site she uses for crime uh, in your due diligence as far as crime stats. Besides checking online fix, what, what website do you like to use for crime? Yeah, I just go to Trulia, trulia.com. It's just like a, like I think it's like a home, you know, valuation type website, like a Zillow. Yeah. And so they give you just, just an idea they do like a color scale of like six different like shades of blue and it'll just give you an idea of the, the crime and it kind of tells you if it's theft or larceny or whatever kind of you know crimes are there just give you an idea it is and then also in some big cities out there you may want to uh, do a search for a crime map like chicago has its own gangland crime map you type in the address it will pop up in south side chicago and tells you which gangs are whether it's the Latin, key, Latin Kings or the 
uh, Cobra Kings or whatever on a, a street by street, literally neighborhood. Wow. By neighborhood. So, um, yeah. You know, and then also, obviously, you could always pick up the phone and call the local police department as far as uh, number of crimes committed or, uh, you know, frequency that they've been called out to specific zip codes and things like that. They'll, they're glad to share that with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll definitely make, make calls as well. And once, once we're in due diligence, that's something that we like to do is call. Yep. Crimemapping.com, Shelly says, is a website. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, let's see here. What else we got to say here? Good question. Yep, that's answered. Uh, can you post? Yeah, Doug, I'll be glad to email that out to you again. Uh, I'll be emailing that out to everybody for the rentometer link again for sure. No problem. Um, she says, Bethany says there's plenty of notes out there. What does she like to use? What does she like to use? I mean, as far as finding deals, I guess, Shelly, I think we already discussed that. It's word of mouth, it's connecting. Are you guys contacting banks that will buy any notes from banks or are you buying mostly from other investors, uh, Bethany? Um, primarily other investors right now is primarily, but um, we're create we're always creating new relationships. So again, we just constantly calling and just building new relationships. Yeah, and that's the thing is, I mean, it's there's relationships like you know, you guys have bought notes from me. I've looked at your notes for sale before. You, we've referred, hey, go buy this buyer, go build, go buy from this guy. You know, you you, you have such a variety because every investor. Every note investor, especially if you're buying non-performing, it gets performing for a while, the value goes up. Right. And, you know, at a period of time, if we're raising capital to take on something new, we may sell our performing notes to raise capital to purchase another deal. So right. this is why, as I said, you know, Bethany says that you like going to local events because you'll find out what those other entities are, those LLCs. And that's one thing I always like to ask people, hey, where are you buying at? If you're, if you've got an LLC and I'll see if they've bought anything like contract for deeds. You know, I go to the major counties in the, uh, you know, on the county records and I'll do a search for a Harbor portfolio to see who they sold to. Right. <laughs> and, and reach out to those people for a matter of time. So, right. Um, but what, uh, what are the questions you have for Bethany? This is a great job. Did a really good job, Bethany. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope it was valuable and edu informative and I didn't talk too much. <laughs> oh, you did good. You did good. Uh, and you did, and most people know this is your first presentation uh, at, at an event. Is that correct? Mm -hmm, it is. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> no, you did a good job. I think okay. you did a good job. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, I'm trying to post this one link here for Doug really fast. Best way for people to get a hold of you, Bethany, you've got on there, they just your email address. Yeah, I would just say shoot me over an email. That's my best form of contact. Yep. Perfect there for you. Uh, she was very good, Scott. I know, Mary, I know she was good on there. Perfect. Okay. A says, Bethany Rock, smooth, informative presentation. See, you got, you're building, got a fan club there. Awesome. <laughs> I'll stuff. do it again. I'll do it again. There you go. Uh, awesome. Well, hey, guys. Uh, any other questions? I think, you know, Bethany, um, let's talk to something here because a lot of people over think a lot of things. You're going to learn more from breaking down your first asset versus trying to learn everything, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. Do you want me to take this off my screen? No, leave it up. It's fine for a couple more minutes. Leave it up. Fine. Okay. All right. They, I'm sorry. They see my face, they, you know, your contact information is good there for you. But okay. when you started, when you first started, if you can think back, and it's been a few years, what did you start doing due diligence on? Did you start doing like deals, sample deals you looked at, looked at some listing websites and started breaking down assets off other websites? You remember kind of that you know, individual deals that you'd already bought, you double checked, how do you kind of get started? I, I think it's, it has been a while and I'm trying to remember the first few deals that my dad got. And I think that um, he had, I think he did mailers to private sellers for a while. I believe that's what he did. And um, I'm pretty sure that's what he did. And so that's how we initially had started, which I still think it's a good, a good way. I don't know, I don't do it that often. So I don't know, you know, if it's worth it like how much of an outcome you get from it. But um, I know people do it and that's how he got his first few deals, I believe. And um, again, when we first started, and I think we were using online sources too, but when we first started, I mean, like I said, I was doing like all of our due diligence, like before we'd even offer, where by the time we're like, okay, this one looks good, let's offer, it was gone. So that was kind of what we did. And that's when I was like, okay, this isn't a good idea. We should probably like not do due diligence first, 
So it's like a lot of trial and error and going back and forth and like getting into deals and finding things out and then having to cancel and like, oh, sorry, like I'm new, I'm learning still, you know? So that's kind of, that was kind of like the dynamic of, you know, my time initially. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you got to be fast a lot of times at offers and you don't want to do, you don't need to do all the due diligence on the front end before making an offer because it may not be available you know, right. focus on a few things. And then when you get your offer approved, that's when you start writing checks or paying for BPOs and O&E reports and stuff like that. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, do you do uh, due diligence services for people? Um, so that's in the works right now. Um, it's something I've been thinking about for a while right now. I've been only doing it for my own portfolio, um, but it's in the works right now. And it is something that I want to, I want to do. Awesome. Well, cool. Keep us in mind when you start. Yeah. That, all right. So, all right. Well, hey, we're going to we're going to wrap it up here. Bethany, thank you so much for coming on and sharing uh, your due diligence uh, checklist and what you go through. It's been awesome having you on. You did a great job. We're going to have to have you come back at another time. All right. That would be great. I really do appreciate it. This was great. Awesome, guys. All right, everybody. Way to go. Way to show up there for due diligence on everybody. Uh, thank you again so much for being here. On uh, Note Camp uh, 2021, hope you got in the questionnaire. Sorry, I didn't see it pop up there. You want to explain what Note Investors University is about? Oh, oh, my Note Investor University. Oh, sure. Um, so yeah, so um, we actually we have an, a university um, that where we're teaching people who want to get into to notes, um, into either learning for their own portfolio just to invest, or if they want to get in and actually get in as a business. And so it's, that's more so my fiance's territory. So I would say, go check out the website and you could schedule a consultation with him to learn more. But yeah, we, we work with, uh, with people that just want to learn and, and that's about it. <laughs> awesome. Great stuff. Yeah. Cool. All right, everybody. 